because we think well of ourselves, but nonetheless never suppose ourselves capable of producing a painting like one of Raphael's, or a dramatic scene like one of Shakespeare's, we convince ourselves that the capacity to do so is quite extraordinarily marvelous, a wholly uncommon accident, or, if we are still religiously inclined, a mercy from on high. Thus, our vanity, our self-love, promotes the cult of the genius. For only if we think of him as being very remote from us, as a miraculum, does he not aggrieve us. Even Goethe, who was without envy, called Shakespeare his star of the most distant heights, in regard to which one might recall the line, the stars, these we do not desire. But, aside from these suggestions of our vanity, the activity of the genius seems in no way fundamentally different from the activity of the inventor of machines, the scholar of astronomy or history, the master of tactics. All these activities are explicable if one pictures to oneself people whose thinking is active in one direction, who employ everything as material, who always zealously observe their own inner life and that of others, who perceive everywhere models and incentives, who never tire of combining together the means available to them. Genius, too, does nothing except learn first how to lay bricks, then how to build, except continually seek for material and continually form itself around it. Every activity of man is amazingly complicated, not only that of the genius, but none is a miracle. Whence, then, the belief that genius exists only in the artist, orator, and philosopher, that only they have intuition, whereby they are supposed to possess a kind of miraculous eyeglass with which they can see directly into the essence of the thing. It is clear that people speak of genius only where the effects of the great intellect are most pleasant to them, and where they have no desire to feel envious. To call someone divine means, here there is no need for us to compete. Then, everything finished and complete is regarded with admiration. Everything still becoming is undervalued. But no one can see in the work of the artist how it has become. That is its advantage, for wherever one can see the act of becoming, one grows somewhat cool. The finished and perfect art of representation repulses all thinking as to how it has become. It tyrannizes as present completeness and perfection. That is why the masters of the art of representation count above all as gifted with genius, and why men of science do not. In reality, this evaluation of the former and undervaluation of the latter is only a piece of childishness in the realm of reason.